Next, we're going to talk about clock synchronization. So we've established every computer pretty much contains a quartz clock, not an atomic clock because atomic clocks are too expensive and too bulky. So what we need to do is make do with these less accurate quartz clocks and we have to somehow try and make the clocks reasonably accurate nevertheless. So these quartz clocks will drift a little bit they, because their rate does not match up exactly with what the correct clock tick rate should be. And we end up with clock skew. So clock skew is if we look at two different clocks at the same instant in time and we compare the timestamps from those clocks, clock skew is the difference between those two. And we what, uh, what we want to do with clock synchronization is to minimize the skew as much as possible. Now, in the types of networks that we have, in asynchronous or partially synchronous networks, it is not possible to reduce the clock skew to zero. The best we can do is to reduce it as much as we can, uh, but there's always going to be a bit of an error tolerance remaining. Now, the way that we typically do clock synchronization in practice is using a protocol called NTP, the Network Time Protocol. There's also another protocol called PTP, but we won't talk about that in this course. And the way NTP works is that there's a server and we assume the server has some accurate clock source, such as an atomic clock or a GPS receiver. And clients can query the server and ask it for the server's current time. And then the client will adjust its own time based on the time that it got from the server. So NTP is very widely deployed. Almost all operating systems that are used nowadays have NTP built in. So for example, in macOS, the settings dialog looks like this here. You can choose the NTP server here or type in your own. In this case, I've got time.euro.apple.com as, as my time server. Um, but most other operating systems will have a very similar looking dialog where also you can adjust and choose your NTP server if you want it. Now, the way that NTP works is that uh, servers are arranged into what are called strata. So stratum one is just the accurate time sources, that is atomic clocks or GPS receivers. Stratum one is a server that is connected directly to a stratum zero time source. Stratum two is a server that is not directly connected to, a, to an accurate time source, but it, which gets its time from a stratum one server. And stratum, two, th stratum three server gets its clock from a stratum two server and so on. And so there are a whole bunch of statistical techniques and tricks that are used in order to try and improve the quality of our estimates of time. So one thing that NTP does is, for example, to query multiple servers if they are available, because it could be that one of those servers is misconfigured or it's got a fault or something. And so it's reporting a wildly inaccurate time. And so if you're querying three servers or five servers, then you can tell if there's one of the servers which is a real outlier and the other servers are all quite close together. In that case, NTP can exclude that outlier and just keep the, the data points from the servers that, that seem to be reliable. Another technique that is used is to query a server not just once, but multiple times over the course of several minutes. And so that will then ensure that at least any random variations in network delay can hopefully get filtered out. Now, if there are systematic variations in network delay, having multiple samples won't help you, but at least multiple samples will reduce the random error. And with NTP, if you have a good quality network connection, it is possible to get your clock synchronized to the server within a couple of milliseconds uh, skew. If you are on a poor quality network connection over some kind of busy Wi-Fi over a, a heavily loaded internet connection, then the accuracy could be much, much worse than that. So you always have to be careful when, uh, when assuming synchronized clocks. Now, let's have a look at how NTP estimates the clock skew between the client and the server. It works by sending a message over a network again, as usual. So we have a request message that gets sent from the client to the server. And as the client is sending this message, it records the clock according to the client's timestamp, the timestamp T1, which is the timestamp at which the client sent out this message. And it copies that timestamp T1 into the request message. The NTP server, when it receives that message, it will also record the time according to the server's own clock at which it received that timestamp. And we'll call that T2, at which it, sorry, at which it received that message. We'll call that T2. Now the server might take a little bit of time to process the message, but eventually the server will reply. Uh, and T3 is the timestamp according to the server's clock at which the response got sent out. So now the response is going to contain all three timestamps so far. So T1 simply gets copied from the request over to the response. The server doesn't do anything with T1. 
T2 and T3 came from the surface clock as the arrival time and the response time, uh, respectively. And finally, when the response is received by the client, the client again records the timestamp according to the client's clock at when that response was received. And so we have now four timestamps. And from those timestamps, we're going to try to work out what the skew is between the two clocks. So first of all, we can work out how long did the message is spent traveling through the network. And we're going to call that the total network delay delta. And that time has got to be T4 minus T1. So that is the total time that it's spent uh, from the client's point of view, from the time it sent the request to the time it received a response, minus the time that the uh, message was spent processing on the server. So minus T3 minus two, which is the processing time on the server. And the remaining time has, has got to be then the total time that was spent in the network by the response and the request taken together. Now, what we don't know is the breakdown of those two, how much time did the request spent in the network and how much time did the response spent in the, net, spend in the network. If you want to work out that one way network latency, you need synchronized clocks. And the whole point of this exercise here is that we don't have a synchronized clock. We're trying to build a synchronized clock. So we don't have a way of measuring that one way network latency. We can only measure the sum of the two network latencies put together. But what we can do is just make an assumption that the network latency is symmetric in both directions. So we're going to assume that the request latency is the same as the response latency. And if this is true, then the response latency will be delta over two because it's just going to be half the total delay. So this means now we can estimate the timestamp that the server should have at the moment in time when the response is received by the client. So from the client's point of view, it's time T4. But we know that the server sent its response at T3. And we're going to estimate that the response spent delta over 2 traveling through the network. And so we're going to estimate that at the time when the client receives the response, the clock on the server says T3 plus delta over 2. That's our estimate of the server's clock. Now that we have an estimate of the server's clock, we can estimate the clock skew because we can just take our estimate of the server's clock minus T4, which is the client's clock, and that will give us the instantaneous difference in time between the two clocks at that moment. And then if you substitute in delta and simplify the uh, expression, you get this expression here, um, which is our best estimate that we can do of what the clock skew is. Now that we have the skew between the two clocks, the client can correct its own clock and tries to bring it in sync with the server. And what the client does in that situation now depends on how big the clock skew is. So firstly, let's look at a case where the clock skew is fairly small. So let's say theta is less than 125 milliseconds. In this case, what the client is going to do is to slightly speed up or slow down its clock as necessary in order to bring it in line with what the server is. And so it's going to change its clock rate at, at most by 500 ppm. So at most by half a millisecond per second adjustment. And so over the course of a couple of minutes, this means that hopefully the client clock and the server clock will sort of drift together and converge towards the same state. And this is called slewing the clock. That is the term that NTP uses for this. If the skew is too big between the client and the server, then, the, uh, then uh, NTP is going to step the clock, which means it's simply going to forcibly adjust the clock um, so even if it, this might mean moving the clock backwards or moving it forward, but it's just going to jump right to the timestamp estimated from the server clock. And from then onwards, it's going to try and do everything smoothly. But there is this initial discontinuity of time where the client steps its clock. And finally, it could happen that NTP decides that the skew between the client and the server is so big that NTP refuses to adjust the clock it just says, no, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to assume that something has gone very wrong. I don't know if the client's clock is very wrong or the server's clock is very wrong, but this is just so bad. I'm not going to do anything here. It's going to leave the adjustment for the human operator to solve. So this means now, if you do have software that is relying on clocks being synchronized, you have to be very careful to actually measure the clock skew between the clocks and make sure that it doesn't get too big because it could happen that an NTP client ends up in this panic state and just refuses to sync its server, uh, to, to sync its clock with the server. And so you've got then an NTP client whose clock is way off. It might be half an hour or more wrong uh, compared to the server. And 
NTP is not going to correct it. So you do have to be very careful if you have software that assumes synchronized clocks. This is an example of slewing in action. So you can see here, the red line here is the skew, the offset between the two clocks. And it starts off at about 10 milliseconds offset and then the correction gets applied so that it ends up being round about zero uh, clock skew. And the blue line is the, the tick rate the, at which the, the client clock is running. And so the client here has applied slewing up to about minus 45 ppm. So that means that the quartz crystal in the client must have been a bit fast. It was running a bit fast by about 45 ppm. And by slowing down the, the, the quartz by 45 ppm, now the NTP client has brought the tick rate of the client roughly in, in line with the server. So now both clocks are moving ahead at about the same rate and no longer drifting apart. So this is very nice, but the consequence of NTP is that you have to be very careful when writing certain pieces of code. So this is a piece of code that is very likely going to occur in all sorts of different software where you have some function that does something, do something here, and you want to measure how long that function takes to run. And so in order to measure that time, you simply take a timestamp from the clock before uh, you start the function and you take another timestamp after you finish the function and then you calculate the difference between the two. This is an example here in Java, but this could just as well be in any other programming language. It's not specific to Java. Now, what could happen is that NTP decides to step the clock right while you're in the middle of executing this do something function. And the stepping the clock means that now the timestamp ret returned by current time millis after the, the do something is going to be somehow wildly different from what it was before. So it could be that the time was time the clock was moved backwards, in which case this difference in timestamps could end up being negative. And who knows what your software is going to do if it measures a negative amount of time elapse. Things could crash or things could go badly wrong in all sorts of interesting ways. Also, it could be that this number ends up being far too large because if the client, the NTP client steps the clock forwards, in that case, now it's going to, um, it's, it's going to have end time being much bigger than it, a much greater timestamp than it ought to be. And so the difference will be greater than it ought to be. So if you want to do this kind of time measurement, it is not good to rely on a clock like current time millis. Instead, what you should do is use a different API. So Java provides this other function here called system.nanotime. And nanotime is designed for this kind of thing. So there's the superficial difference. Current time millis uses milliseconds, nanotime uses nanoseconds. That's just the superficial difference. The real difference is that nanotime is what's called a monotonic clock. And the monotonic clock is one in which NTP stepping will not affect it. So this clock is not going to suddenly jump forwards or backwards as the name, name size as the name says, monotonic clock means that it moves forward at a more or less constant rate. Slewing will still affect it because that improves the accuracy of the clock, but it's not going to suddenly jump with a discontinuity. And so using nano time here to measure the time elapsed is the correct way of doing this. So this difference between monotonic and time of day clocks is very important. So um, a time of day clock is, for example, the Java's current time millis, which gives you the time elapsed since a fixed reference point. In the case of Unix timestamps, it's this 1st of January 1970 epoch date. Whereas a monotonic clock, the value you get back from it is some arbitrary time since, for example, this particular computer booted up. So this means that the timestamp by itself doesn't really mean anything. You can't send the timestamp over a network to another computer and compare those because two different computers will have booted up at different times. And so their monotonic timestamps are, are simply not comparable. But you can use the monotonic clock for time measurements because if you calculate the difference between two timestamps from a monotonic clock, then the time will have moved forward at a near constant rate between those two timestamps. And so that's a meaningful measure of time elapsed. Whereas if you do that sort of difference with time of day clocks, then you are affected by, by jumping due to NTP. You're also affected by leap seconds potentially, which we talked about earlier. So uh, these are very bad for measuring elapsed time. But on the other hand, time of day timestamps, you can compare across different computers. 
if you remember earlier the example I had of the TLS certificate, which was valid until a certain date, if my computer wants to check whether that certificate is still valid, well, it has to have the accurate current date. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to compare the timestamp in the certificate with the current timestamp on that computer. So uh, in this case, we do have to use a time of day clock and do we do have to synchronize those clocks across uh, multiple machines because otherwise we won't have accurate timestamps. So as I said, many programming languages and operating systems provide APIs for this. Uh, in Linux, for example, there's the clock get time call and you can pass an argument to it, say, which tells it whether you want the real time clock, which is the time of day clock, or you want the monotonic clock. But in other languages, uh, there will be similar APIs for this. You will have to check the API documentation. But it's important to keep in mind this distinction. If you do need to measure times, uh, it's not just about the, the resolution of the clocks, but the distinction between a monotonic and a non-monotonic clock is very important.